uh, the word of God. We thank you for salvation. And Lord, we set our hearts today um, that they might be set before you in grace. Lord, to receive your word of God in grace and peace, to grow in this grace and knowledge of you, Lord Jesus. And we ask today the teaching of your Holy Spirit into our hearts and our lives. Lord, that, um, that we'd be encouraged. One, we'd be comforted concerning the days which we live and, and uh, just comforted, Lord, concerning those that have died in Christ ahead of us, uh, family members, friends. And, but Lord, also looking that uh, we could be of that generation, that we could be alive and remain when you come back. So Lord, teach us today and then uh, just encourage us, Lord, that we'd be the church watchful and ready for your return. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So find your way to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 as we continue this study through uh, 1 Thessalonians. Um, encourage you. The real, the real issue at hand is this, the imminent return of Jesus Christ. You know, there's a lot of um, rumbling, so-called, amongst the family, right? Family, family discussions in the body of Christ concerning the timing of the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 most clearly reveals there is a, a rapture. Paul says that we who are alive and remain will be caught up, will be, will be harpazo. There is a rapture of the church. So don't, don't throw out that doctrine concerning uh, the, the rapture. Now, in this family talking amongst the body of Christ is, well, when does the rapture occur? Well, I put forth this to you. Most simply, most clearly, most powerfully, Jesus taught something very simply, is that he could return at any moment. Any moment he can come. Now with that, then I hold to this, I hold that there's only one view of the timing of the rapture that actually honors all of Jesus' words in Scripture. And Paul taught it this way to the church at, at Thessalonica, and it's this, that, that the Lord can come today. Now, we're not in tribulation. We're not in what the Bible calls the 70th week of Daniel. The, the rapture of the church has not happened. The restrainer is still in place, keeping the Antichrist from being revealed. Now, I believe consistently what we're looking at here is, yes, we are living in days that are becoming more and more troubling. I've been reading my newspaper while well, I read it online, and um, so is it still called a newspaper if you get it through the internet? It's no longer called a newspaper. It's called a website, right? I've been reading and I know that uh, there's just some, some great encouragement that the church needs today. Because if you got your eyes fixed on, if you have your eyes fixed upon what's happening in this world, or if you're fixing your eyes upon your own personal situation, you may have watched your 401k reduced to a 101k uh, over the, the last years. And my guess is the systems of this world will, will continue to go lower and lower and, and more and more decline. But I would encourage you in this. So that you would um, um, find a way to turn off your cell phones and to take your conversations outside and to, to not disrupt the study. Um, so that you would have today, church, that you would learn to be watchful in everything. All of 1 Thessalonians was written for the church that they would be ready for the Lord's return. Chapter 1, it was, and to wait for his son who's coming from heaven. It doesn't get any clearer than that. It doesn't get any more simple than that, that we, the church, are to wait. Now, Paul continues, out of the thought of being ready for the Lord's return, that we'll meet him in the clouds, and he, and he gives a final word of exhortation to the day that's consistent with everything Jesus taught. And chapter 5 begins, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So the understanding, consistent with what Paul told this church previously, glance back with me at chapter 4, verse 15. When you understand, I mean, we have the Bible. We have the Bible throughout history. It's both good and bad. When here's the bad part, is that men come and twist scriptures. And so much can, be, can, can come, and there can be all kinds of teachings, and then there can be another layer and another layer, and, and yet, let's go back to the Word of God in its simplicity of truth. Look at this. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not proceed or not prevent them, which are asleep. So this understanding here that, that is, is very reality, the rapture is going to come at a moment when you least expect it. Jesus is going to appear. Jesus is going to snatch away or catch up. And, and this teaching that Paul brings to the church at Thessalonica is consistent. And here's how consistent it is with what Jesus said. Look with me uh, at Acts chapter 1. So when you look at Acts chapter 1, 
Remember that Jesus still is there talking in the beginning of the book of Acts. So Luke, who writes his Gospel of Luke, and then he carries it into the book of Acts, and you'll find that by the time Jesus is there and Acts 1 verse 4, they're assembled together with him. He commands them not to depart from Jerusalem, but they're to wait for the promise of the Father, which he saith, you have heard of me. And then he talks about John baptized with water, but Jesus is going to baptize with the Holy Ghost in just a few days. My paraphrase there. Verse 6, therefore when they come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, at this time are you going to restore the kingdom? Is now the, the days of the coming of the Son of Man, is this the kingdom of God? And the answer is, in verse 7, and this is what Jesus says, by the word of the Lord, right? You, you're tracking with me? Jesus said this. And he said unto, unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which your father has put in his own power, but you, or again, authority, and then you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. Now, when we look at First Thessalonians, when we, we consider that Paul says, hey, you, you have no need that I write unto you, Concerning what? Times and seasons. You can't know the exact times and seasons. So when you look up the word seasons, don't think, you know, winter, spring. Don't think winter at all this time of year. <laughs> don't think spring, summer. Don't think seasons of the year. Don't even think seasons of your life. Don't think of them that way. The word actually is related to the measure of time. So when you understand that the Father has in his own power the measure of time, he knows exactly when Jesus is coming back. In fact, Jesus instructed the apostles and told them to be ready at any moment because even he himself, when he was here on earth, he said the Father has held this in his own power, his own authority. And so when you say, you have no need that I would write to you about times and seasons, he says that, that you know that the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night. Now, when you start to put this together, invariably this has to be discussed. There is a difference, and well, I'll form it in the phrase of a question. Is there a difference between the rapture of the church and the second coming? Now, biblically, the day of the Lord is used for, um, well, let's just say it's used in a broad sense. In one place, it looks like, oh, that's a specific day. The day the Lord sets his foot down on the Mount of Olives, it splits open. There's, a, there's a, another day of the Lord when he, when he gathers and, and fights against the enemies out in the Valley of Jezreel. And so you start to get this phrase, day of the Lord, and it's used to concern the, the coming of the Lord. What's the difference between the rapture and the second coming? Well, in the rapture of the church, Jesus comes in the clouds and the church is snatched up to meet the Lord in the air. Just as he ascended into heaven, he returns to the clouds, the church is raptured up, and then we go to be with the Lord. Now, seven years later, after the 70th week of Daniel is fulfilled, how do I know they're different events? How do I know that the thief in the night passage is concerning the rapture? Well, when I read Daniel chapter 12, and I did again this morning in preparation, it speaks of the abomination of desolation, Speaking of that which Daniel prophetically was told that there would come a time when the beast or the Antichrist would make the Holy of Holies desolate through the worship of idolatry right in the Holy of Holies where only God was to be worshipped. And, and therefore, Jesus says when you read, let the reader understand that Daniel spoke of this abomination of desolation, meaning that there is going to be a moment in time where that, that the Holy of Holies is going to be defiled and no longer is God going to be worshipped in the Holy of Holies. So when Jesus gives future reference to the book of Daniel, it's yet prophetic from Jesus' days that there is a time coming when this abomination of desolation will take place. And then Daniel records, because he was prophetically given 1,290 days. Blessed is he who makes it to the end, the 1,290 days. So if you understand, 1,260 is three and a half years when you're using a 360-day calendar. 1,290 and then 1,335, most people understand that Jesus will come back and will restore unto Jerusalem the true worship of God. And that Daniel 11, or excuse me, Daniel 12, is talking about his return, visible return, when he actually comes and sets his foot down. In the rapture of the church, Jesus is in the air. It's a blessed hope the church is gathered to him. In the second coming of Jesus Christ, he comes and destroys the enemies of God. Two distinctly different things, yet encouraging you as believers today to be watchful. Because this whole thief in a night thing, when you look at verse 2, you yourselves know perfectly. Uh, should we not already have that? That means you have perfect understanding of 
One simple fact. The Lord is coming as a thief. Now he talked about the goodman of his house who went away on a far journey and that he, he would uh, told his porter, if you will, the one who was guarding the, the door, the doorkeeper, he says, I tell you to watch for me. And so Jesus, in giving that parable, he says as the Son of Man is going to come at an hour you do not expect him. And he says that the, in another place, he, he also gives a parable of if the goodman of the house knew what hour the thief was going to come in and rob and steal, right? It's like this. If I told you tonight, if I gave you warning and said, hey, I have a good tip, uh, you know, well, I'll, I'll use an example from here. Friday night, we're doing ministry right here, uh, reaching out um, the Gift of Grace clothing closet, and I, I leave all the sound equipment out. Some days I cover it up. Uh, Friday night. It was out in the open together with my computer and one of the, uh, the characters who came in here, and I call him a character because I don't think he was alone in there. I think he had a few other things going on inside him. Uh, he says, is that your sound equipment back there? You know, took note of what was there. So you know what I did? Oh, he won't come back and break through the window and steal it. I took the equipment away and locked it up and I left, I left the, the tablecloth off so everybody could see the sound equipment's not here anymore. I don't want to pay for a window to be broken either. So when you understand and you heed the warnings and you say the Lord's going to come as a thief at night, Jesus taught that the, the goodman of the house, right, the, the one um, who was going to guard the house, if he knew that he was going to be robbed tonight, he would stay awake. Now I'd add in 2016, he'd stay awake with a with a 20 gauge, right? Concerning uh, the weaponry that's available out there and what someone might come. Uh, if you're over in the UK, you, you have a baseball bat that you stay awake with, you know? And so you understand this, the, the security of this. And, and, and why would we as Christians now check our brains at the door when we get saved? Let's get into this. Let's understand. When he says, you know perfectly that, that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night, we should expect then the Lord to come at any moment. Again, therefore, the, the doctrine of the imminent return of Christ. Now, how's this going to be? Well, he says in verse 3, he says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in the darkness, in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Now, you'll understand here 3 and 4. 3 says that when the rapture comes and those that remain, those that are here, they're going to immediately go into judgment. They're going to immediately go into wrath. They're going to immediately begin to experience sudden destruction. Now, I believe consistent with the Bible. I believe the Bible is consistent. I believe everything given in there and the types that we see in the Old Testament are prophetic of what's to come when you understand abomination of desolation. There was a type in history, a man named Antiochus Epiphanes, who was of the uh, either the Seleucids, yeah, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, uh, two of the four warring branches of, of uh, um, what's his name? The Great, Alexander the Great. Thank you. Two of uh, two of the four branches of of his uh, generals, they formed empires and they warred back and forth right over top of Jerusalem. And one came in, Antiochus Epiphanes, and he defiled the temple through the worship of Jupiter and the Holy of Holies. And guess what? He took a sow, uh, a female pig, and offered her up as a sacrifice and poured the blood. And well, um, Josephus uses a, a very descriptive word. He says the broth of a pig and defiles the altar and everything. You know what, a, what a defiling that would be. And so then the Maccabees come and restore that. That becomes a foreshadow for what's yet to come and when the Antichrist is going to do this. The Bible is filled with examples. And I, I, I encourage you on this. Concerning the rapture of the church, concerning the warnings, concerning being ready. Yes, Jesus is coming as a thief in the night. Are you ready? Are you watchful? Are you, are you considering today that, that you're found in Christ? Look at the pronouns in verse 3. They shall say, then sudden destruction shall come upon them, and they shall not escape. We'll, we'll get this. We are to actually be of those who pray that we might always be counted worthy to escape. Some people, their criticism, biggest criticism amongst the family concerning the time of the rapture and say, you're just, you're just into escapism. You're just trying to get out of this world and its troubles. I said, no, I'm, I, I am an escapist. Because I want to not be here for the wrath of God. I don't want to be here. And look at that. It's they and them. Now, let's look at Luke 17. Now, just as we read Luke 21, you understand that Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, Luke, who wrote the gospel according to Luke, he divides a little bit differently in regards to the instruction and teaching concerning the return of the Lord. I'm telling you today, I believe as I study Luke 17, and head on over to verse 26, that Luke is talking about the rapture of the church. 
So Luke, Luke 17, 26, he says, and beside all this, between us, that's not right. Is that right? Luke 17, that was 16. Somebody came in and put the wrong thing in my Bible. I didn't make any mistakes. <laughs> okay, I got the right verse. That was my mistake. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. See that plural there, days? See that? So the days of the Son of Man. So there's the day of the Lord, and so you're starting to put this together. There's days of the Son of Man, just like the days of Noah. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So you remember how that went, is that they, they go into the ark, and that very day, who shut the door, by the way? God shut the door on the ark. And he closes them in, and he seals them, and he protects them. Did, did it rain like in, did the, did the floods come like, you know, sometime after? No. The day that they enter in. Very important you get this. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, you guys remember him, right? If you don't know who Lot is, you got to go back and read the book of Genesis. And uh, in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Now, how did Lot, how was Lot's went out of Sodom? I, how did he go out? Well, he went out, well, he was snatched away. He was lingering, he was waiting, and all of a sudden, the angels say, we gotta get out of here. And the two angels that came down and actually blinded all the men of the city who wanted to come and uh, have uh, sodomy with, with the angels, they blinded them, they, they grabbed Lot back into the house, and then that next morning, the angels take Lot out of the city, and then judgment comes. Now, I think it's important we understand this here. The same day, the same day, and then it comes and destroys them all. Even thus it shall be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Apocalypso. Guess what the, the last name of the book of the Bible is in Greek? Apocalypso. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Everything ties together. All the answers are in Revelation. And you start to understand that which the church was encouraged with, uh, First Thessalonians, probably Paul's first letter to the church. The earliest writings that he wrote, he's already encouraging them about the appearing or the revelation of Jesus Christ. In that day, Luke, Luke continues, he, shall, he, the, he which shall be on the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not go down and take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. So you get this understanding that when the Lord comes, that... Um, you know, this, this whole thing of, of are you ready? Are you watchful? We're going to tie this off here a little bit more today. Who, whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. So you know that. You know much about Lot's wife. You know what? She sought to preserve her life. She, something was happening there where she didn't want to lose the life that she had back in the world. I tell you, in that night, there shall be two in, in, be, in one bed, one shall be taken, the other left. Two shall be grinding together, one shall be taken, the other left. Two shall be in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto, unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Now, when you look at that in the context, and you know about the, the passage where the, you know, the eagles gather to the carcass, much like a vulture, this word here for carcass, you know, the, uh, this word here for body is a, is a different word than the other passage. I believe this here is speaking of the church being gathered and lifted up into the air. I believe this is all talking rapture. Now, who goes? Who goes in the rapture? Now, as we look into this, and I, you know, I've been teaching this for a while, and I, I could just, I could have just phoned it in today. You know, you ever, you ever met a pastor, or you go to a pastor's conference, I go to conferences, and, and you come to Bible study, and it's like, that's all rehashed stuff. Wherever he got that from, he, he downloaded that sermon, and he just phoned it in. He just, he, he read somebody's commentary, and he, he didn't want to do the study, he didn't want to actually show up, so he just sat home, dialed the phone number in, sent it in, and all right, I'm out of here. Listen, I'm not phoning in today. Fresh study, understanding. I would encourage you more and more to get this here today, that you would have this. I want this to be yours. So when we look at 1 Thessalonians 5, and it says, upon them, upon them, and they, that the wrath comes upon them. Know this, that the church at Sardis, who was said, you have a name that's your life, but you're dead. Of all the letters written to the churches, it becomes painfully obvious that there are those in Sardis who aren't saved. There are those who are of the they in that church of Sardis. So let's look at Revelation 3. Am I trying to scare you today? Hardly. I'm trying to comfort you. And as you look at the church of Sardis, so that's Revelation 3, verse 1. 
Unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he that hath the seven spirits of God and seven stars. I know thy works, you have a name that thou livest and art dead. What's a dead church? Listen, a dead church is an unsaved church. Meaning this, that those that are not born from above, those that have not had the breath of the living God breathed into them. We would say in our, in our day and age, a church that doesn't teach that you must be born again to go to heaven. Unregenerated. So you understand that there are going to be those in this church of Sardis who are not saved. So look at this. It's, it's very interesting to me. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. I haven't found that you've grown into maturity. Well, listen, if you're not born again, you're not able to grow into maturity. If you are born again, what begins to happen? You grow. You grow in the Lord. You, you, you're saved, and then you begin to, to grow into the works that he has prepared for you. Verse 3, Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, and hold fast and repent. Repent. So it means that those in the church need a repentance. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Now I want you to know, Revelation 3.3 3 and 1 Thessalonians 5.3 uh, speaks of those who are attending, those who are in person, those who are involved but yet are not saved. It's a very, a very sobering thought to realize that that church of Sardis, they, did they have the way of salvation and they turned away from the way of salvation and stopped preaching the gospel and stopped saying, you must be born again? I don't know. But I do know that we find him in a situation where Jesus says, I'm going to come upon you as a thief, so if you shall not watch. Listen, the first quality and understanding of, of being watchful is you must be saved. And as you're saved and then the Spirit of God is in you, the flesh can't watch, by the way. Jesus proved that out in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The flesh can't watch over time, and the flesh, the flesh is not able. Now look what else he says to the church here at Sardis. Verse 4, Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Well, how do you get white garments? Well, all of us born into this world as human beings are born with a, a filthiness uh, in, in what... Isaiah prophesied, he says that all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags before God. How we get white garments is we exchange our sin-stained garments and our, our, our unrighteousness, we exchange that for the righteousness that is found in Jesus Christ. So there are a few in Sardis who do walk in white. And they, he says they're they worthy. Well, what makes us worthy? What makes us worthy is our faith in Christ Jesus. He that overcometh, I love that word, nikaios, it's victory. He that, he that has overtaken all the things of this world in sin, he's overcome all of it. Now, so every one of you knows people who've been overtaken by alcohol. Every one of you knows someone who's been overtaken by any various sins. All of us know people. In fact, some of us were in time past overtaken. We get saved, we get set free. And now we have this quality here that's set forth. He that overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. This is why the church of Sardis becomes most interesting to me because Jesus has the power to blot somebody's name out of the book of life. It's an incredible concept that, that is worthy of saying, you know what, with fear we must attend to this. Are you saved? On today's Invite Sunday, I don't know if anybody in here, you know, came in today and they're, they're not saved. They don't know that their sins are forgiven. They don't know that, that they're only righteous in Christ Jesus. They're trusting in some works of their own. But today it would be this simple that says what? Jesus says to those who are not saved, your name is blotted out of the book of life. On the contrary, those that are saved, I'll confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Who's going to go in the rapture? <coughs> Those that are saved, those that are watchful, those that are saved and, and are watching and ready, the Lord's coming back. And this is very helpful for you and I because guess what? Jesus' coming for his church is still as a thief in the night. However, now Paul instructs the church here. He says that there are those who are not going to escape. I want to be of those in the church that I pastor. I don't want unbelievers here in church. Now, I want them to come into church and be saved and become believers and then be discipled. So I don't want anybody to feel comfortable in here as an unbeliever, uh, not born again. I don't want them to stay, ever stay comfortable in church. I want you to be so afflicted with your guilt and shame of your sinfulness until you say what? I need to be saved. 
But if you are saved, I want to bring all the comfort I can to you of who you are in Christ Jesus and how he saved you and the finished work of the cross. And if you're trusting and believing in him, that you would be comforted. Verse 4 is where the comfort begins back in 1 Thessalonians 5. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Isn't that, be isn't that beautiful? Called out of darkness into light. So you have, you have these great passages of Scripture. You are all children of light. Now, he's not talking about the they. He's now talking to those who are saved. You are all children of the light. Everyone born again is now born into the light. Right? The light came into the world. Men loved darkness. They wouldn't come into the light. John 3, 36. John 3, 17 and 18. This understanding is very clear that you come to faith in Christ Jesus, you're now children of the light, children of the day, you're not of the night, you're not of darkness. So I'll just add this. Therefore, if you're children of the, of the light, walk as children of the light, Ephesians 5, 8. So if you're in the Spirit, if you live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5, Romans 12. So you, you start to put this into place. Let's be consistent. Let's be the church now of Fargo, Calvary Chapel Fargo. Let's be consistent with the truth of what's there and receive this and say, you know what, to be children of the light, we're not in darkness. Let's walk in the light as he's in the light. Blood of Jesus cleanses all our sin, 1 John 1, 9. Therefore, let us not sleep as, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. That has with it Matthew 24, Matthew 25, Matthew 26. 24, talking about the, the Lord's second coming and talking about watching. He gives the parable in there. 25, the sheep and the goats, right? The sheep and goats, the great white throne judgment, the separation at the end, the saved and the unsaved. Again, he's saying to watch in there. 26, he goes to the garden and he takes three with him to come and watch and pray and he says, watch and pray. All this tied together that you would understand. The church that is saved is watching and praying for the Lord's return. That's where I want to be found. That's where Paul comforts the church. He says, for they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. We don't need any amens on that, but you understand that Jesus taught that when a servant, and one of his servants would say, the Lord delays his coming, he used an example of a steward who began to carouse in and, and, and drunkenness, and he began to beat his fellow servants. Whenever the church says the Lord can't come back today, it ensues that we become negligent into our relationships with one another, and we get into all kinds of stuff we shouldn't get into. And darkness creeps in. He says in, in verse 8, but let us who are of the day be sober. Now you could say sober versus drunk. It's, it's a clear understanding concerning alcohol, but it's also watch and be sober, be temperate, be under control. Be under the control of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, or temperance, or I'll say again here, sober. Right? In complete control of all of your faculties. And you start to understand what's said. Let us be of the day, be sober, putting on faith, hope, and love. Right? That's really what he says. Now, look how it's read. The breastplate of faith and love. So you think of, of the armor. I mean, I, I mean, I've been to the shooting range, right? That, that center mass, shoot center mass, center mass. Well, if you realize the enemy is going to try to shoot center mass to take people out, deceive them, lie to them. So what do you put on? That breastplate. Everything that covers all the organs. And what do you put on? You put on faith and love and a helmet, the hope of salvation. The greatest of these is love. And these three remain, faith, hope, and love. So first thing written here, and then you'll see the shadow of Ephesians 6, right? The armor, helmet of salvation, uh, shield of faith, sword of the spirit, word of God, feet shy with the preparation of the gospel of peace, breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth. And you start to see all the shadow tied together that he's still saying the same thing to the church and you would have this. Let us be of the day, let's be sober, and let's be ready in the spiritual warfare. Now this, ho this hope of salvation. I like this because the helmet, the hope of salvation, the helmet's salvation in Ephesians 6, here you have what you are to wear. If you have bare minimum understanding here today to be watchful and praying, you really need faith, hope, and love. You really need the breastplate of faith and love. I believe in Jesus Christ. I know that he loves me. I love God. I love others. That really does secure a lot. You know that God loves you. You know that you're loved of God. You know that the cross, the love demonstrated, and you're saved. The, the hope of salvation. Now, don't minimize hope. 
because hope is the future expectation of good. It's not like I, I normally hear, well, are you going to go to heaven when you die? Well, I hope so. When I hear people say that, I'm like, did you not read your Bible? <laughs> well, I usually ask them a, the second question is, and I say to them, well, what does God require for you to get into heaven? So if they're only on an I hope so, then that means that they think they don't quite measure up to what they believe God says they need to do, and then maybe they've never received Jesus Christ. So I ask those two questions so that I can see, well, let me tell you about the hope of salvation in Christ Jesus. As a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us unto wrath, for God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So somewhere in your Bible there, right in your Bible, and you're taking your notes, circle hope, draw a line down and connect it to obtain. Future expe expectation of good, you're not appointed unto wrath. Meaning this, the wrath of God abides upon the children of disobedience. Colossians 1, Ephesians 2. I could be wrong, could be Ephesians 3. You're, the wrath of God abides upon the children of disobedience. Romans chapter 2, that the, 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 the righteous judgment of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness of men who suppressed the truth. And you start to see all this, and so here we are today, church watchful, ready for the Lord's return, church Church, get this. What do you wear now? You wear, you wear that breastplate, faith and, faith and love. Helmet, hope of salvation, what are you going to exchange it for? I'm not going to let anybody come and steal this crown. I'm not going to take my helmet off for a while to inspect it and see if it still works. All right, I'm going to keep that helmet of salvation on until I obtain salvation. And at that place of obtaining salvation, when whether I die or whether I'm raptured, which is what he says next, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So whether you're dying with him or whether you're raptured, you're with him. What do you exchange? Right now, make sure you're wearing that, that helmet as a hope of salvation. I'm going to exchange it for a crown. All those who love his appearing, the crown of life, I'm going to exchange when I'm with him. I'll exchange this cross one day for a crown. In this life, denying self, taking up cross. In this life, wearing that help, the, ho uh, the hope of salvation. God has not appointed us under wrath. Why? We're not appointed unto wrath because the wrath and anger and fury of God upon sin was poured out upon Jesus Christ on that cross. He took the sin of the world upon him. And this is why faith in Christ Jesus works, is that when you're trusting in him, that he died and, and was that substitutionary sacrifice and atonement and covering for sin, you're saved by faith in him. Therefore, faith and love. God demonstrated his own love for us, and then while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm excited and encouraged to be the church that is what? Watchful, ready for our Lord's return. Kind of was like this when I grew up. When mom and dad were away, the kids played. Right? You've heard the saying, when, when the cat's away, the mice play. We got into things. We would do things, you know, we, we knew very well we weren't to throw balls around the house, and, but we, we were into all kinds of sports. We were into whatever kind of sport. And when, we would, when they would leave and go away, we started playing all kinds of sports in the house. Whatever would be basketball, sorry, mom and dad. Uh, <laughs> And we'd wreck things. And then we'd always do the cover-up. Now, I've listened to some of your stories in the room. I know you did the same thing. Mom and dad went away, and you got into stuff, and then you did the cover-up. Listen, church watchful, ready for the Lord's return. When you're walking in righteousness with the Lord, and you're walking in faith and love and hope, and you're walking in that, that salvation, and you have all that, you can't wait for the Lord to come back. But the church who's disobedient, the church who's gotten into other things, the church who's no longer preaching the gospel, the church is no longer most concerned that people are saved, that church is not, not really wanting Jesus to come back. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another also as ye do. So this is not just the pastor's responsibility, but it's the entire body's responsibility to edify the church in love. Verse 12, and we beseech you, brethren, now we, we shift gears, a whole other section, and we beseech you, brethren, to know them which, are, which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. Now we get into this more of this by the word of the Lord, the teachings that Jesus gave. I want you to have all of it. I want you to, to teach and observe and do all the commands that Jesus taught you. 
And so you start to get into this. And when he says, beseech you, brethren, know them that which labor among you. Aren't we to pray for more laborers to go out into the harvest? Isn't this, Paul says, I had received an abundant labor, a grace to labor in his calling. He's called to be an apostle. And then God calls some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. He says, right, know them which labor among you that God had called and put into the body of Christ to edify the body of Christ, to equip the body of Christ, he says, and are over you in the Lord. It simply is a statement of rank and order, meaning this, like if it was a military understanding, you'd say, you, you are to know those who are the generals, the colonels, the majors, the, those of rank who are receiving the orders and going to carry them out. And we together, we would understand that God has given, yes, the church in much the same way to function that we're to be submitted, we're to be in order. And um, let's just glance over at Hebrews chapter 13 with me as well. The writer to Hebrews echoes a very similar thing, and it is helpful for you and I to know that Jesus taught submission unto authority. He taught it with his life. He lays it down in front of Pontius Pilate and even submitted unto ungodly authority, if you will. Hebrews 13, 7 and 17. Just, just lock it in. You want to know about how to conduct yourself in order in church in regards to those that God has called to, to be overseers. 13, 7. Remember them which have the rule over you. You know, that word rule over causes, causes an unsubmitted man or woman to cringe. But to one who is submitted, say, oh, I'm glad there's rule over my life. I know what I'm capable of. Remember them which have rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Again, conversation there, manner of life. 717, let's look at 17. So, so look at Hebrews 13, 7, Hebrews 13, 17. Obey them that have rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch out for your souls. For they watch for your souls, for they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So a great place of understanding what Paul tells the church at Thessalonica, he talks about those who have been given a place of rule and order. Get this, pastors and teachers and, and for the saints and, and how we're to conduct ourselves and that we're to obey, right, again, has with it the submission. Not so much you obey your leaders without question. In fact, it drives me crazy when, uh, as my children grow older, when they're younger, I said, obey me without question. You know, but as they get older and they start to be able to think and make decisions, says, now you got to think. Now you got to listen to the commands and say, how do I obey that completely? It takes a little bit more involvement. In church, when we're going to walk in obedience to the Lord and be submitted under and be able to do one work here, it means that we need to understand, did this come from God? Is this spiritual leadership? Spiritual leadership, it is so important that Paul writes to both Titus and Timothy, instructing them, choose your elders so wisely and check and prove their conduct at home so that when they come and serve in church, that they're without fault and blame in regards to how they conduct themselves in church. Maybe there's just quite a few people who got into leadership that never should have been. But maybe we also should then likewise put 1 Peter 5 forth concerning a pastor, a teacher, a shepherd, an overseer, one in his conduct and how he's to serve and feed and love the body of Christ. And put that all into your notes. So that we're to be at peace with one another, esteem one another in love for the work and for the work's sake. We have gotten so much self-love that just came pouring into the church over the last 15 years that we so like, oh, I don't want to, and this doesn't feel good. And, and we start whining and complaining instead of saying, we receive this. Let's, let's be peaceable with one another. Let's work this out. And he exhorts them, brethren, in verse 14, back in 1 Thessalonians 5, brethren, warn them that are unruly. The word unruly is those that are disorderly, those that refuse to walk in submission to the order that God had given in the church. He says, warn them. Warn the unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, or literally comfort the faint-hearted, support the weak, hold them up, you know, lift up the weak, give everything you can, and then be patient or be long-suffering toward all men. I want to go to a church like this. Don't you want to be a part of a watchful church? And then says, do not render evil for evil, but do good unto all men. Galatians 6, 8 through 10 should be your backdrop there. But do good to all, but especially to those of the household of faith. This watchful church now has various instructions and commands. From 16 to the end is all command. See, does rule over... Does that cause you trouble? Does commands cause you trouble? Here we are in great old independent America and nobody gives any commands to me. Where did that come from? In fact, we're all submitted and under the commands of a higher, of a higher authority. Why are, why are we, by, 
by nature, right? Well, we're seeing a change, but why are we law-abiding in this country? Well, because it was taught and pastors would preach the gospel and people were saved and they understood that authority came from God and they put themselves under and they obeyed the commands and you would obey when nobody was around because it was the right thing to do because God sees everything. And you start to realize that this now as it changes and we know that the Antichrist comes to seek to change times and seasons and laws. When you're down in Mexico, they by nature are, are not law-abiding citizens. All, they have more laws on the books and more disobedience to the laws. Well, they don't trust their government down there. So you start to realize what's really in place here. This is the words of Jesus, and Paul relays them, and these are commands for us. So let, let these commands come into us. Rejoice evermore. All right, rejoice more and more. Rejoice forever. So there's no cause for whining, complaining in the body of Christ. Well, people still do it. Pray without ceasing. So talk with your Father about everything. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What a beautiful time we began in prayer this morning. Thankful. We worship today. Thankful. Man, I, I was just, I was just at, at a week of, of various worship and I was trying to play it back. I don't remember at all in what they called worship that there was any thankfulness going on. And I just replayed this back and I'm like, oh, God, we're so thankful for all that you've done. The will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So as we observe the commands of the Lord, keep receiving them. Quench not the spirit. Don't douse the fire of the Holy Spirit with a bucket of water. That's literally what quench means. So where the, the, the spirit of, of holiness is burning in you or the, the spirit of God's upon you and you're gonna go serve the Lord and, and the, the spirit of God comes upon you and you're gonna go do something for the Lord and you're gonna, you're gonna speak. You know, when someone tries to, to exercise the gifts of the spirit, I don't quench that, I don't douse that, I, I fan that into flames. So you, you can learn and we can all learn and understand Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying. Prophesyings. So again, 1 Corinthians 14, here is your companion text, that we are not to look down upon the, the prophecies. The prophecies of scripture, but even the prophetic word that guides us and prospers us to know what to do in certain situations. Prove all things, hold fast, which is good. Test everything. Do you realize that? People who say this was the Holy Spirit, what should you automatically be able to do? Test the spirits. That's what, it's actually the leader's responsibility to test all things, hold fast, which is good. It's also your responsibility. Test the teaching back against the context of Scripture. Test everything you're listening to. Test what people are saying. Because many false Christs have gone out into this world, many false prophets, and even false believers, they abound. Test, prove all things, hold fast, which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. What a, what a good word for the church. We're, instead of looking for the line saying, is this acceptable to do, we all of a sudden should be thinking, ah, if this even looks like on the outward appearance that this is evil, I can't do this and affect my brothers and sisters in Christ that way. So it, it's a very important understanding. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless into the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people have taken this verse out of context and they preach a health wealth doctrine out of this. See, look, God wants you to have a healthy body. Listen, in the context of this, it means simply this that God preserve your body unto the rapture. So those that are alive and read this, this is everything about being kept in Christ and, and even your body, and so they say, until the rapture of the, of the church. Faithful is he that calleth you and will also do it. Circle 24, make 24, God is faithful, he will complete that work. May you receive today, just, this is great word from the Lord. Brethren, pray for us. I, I add, pray for me, church. I, I, I want your prayers. I mean, here I am wanting to receive the truth of God's word, and there's false doctrines all around, and I always have to separate. Is that true? Is that false? Is that of the Holy Spirit, or is it just flesh and man? Pray for me. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. Keep it holy, right? It wasn't so much a, a kiss as far as like we would think. Our culture doesn't embrace with a kiss, but you know what the church did? The church greeted and sent one another out in the Lord. And that's, that was the practice. Keep it up. Receive one another, and then when we send each other out, all in the Lord. I charge you by the Lord. Now, this is a strong word. I charge you. This is, this is your marching orders. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. It's not just for the pastor. You get this. Where, where did the church ever, throughout all the dark ages, say, we'll tell you what the Bible means? 
That's why they're called dark ages. You understand this. We're to have the word of God. This is to be read. We're to read and understand. And then he says, the most important thing you need, and I leave you with this, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Amen. What are you wearing today? You look down, do you see white robes? Spiritually. Now, we have, a, we, have a, we have a physical clothing policy here. Wear them. Wear clothing. When it comes to spiritual understanding, are your garments still defiled by the sin of this world? Are you, if you stood before God, would your, would your clothing be defiled because you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Is that you would say, I don't have the hope of salvation. Do you not have that helmet on? Well, would it be today that you would just do a, a, an examination and you would look and say, honest before God and say, God, I need to be saved from my sin. I need to be saved from my defiled garments. I need to walk in white. I, I don't know if I have that helmet of salvation on. Because if the Lord comes as a thief, don't you want to be ready for him? Don't you want to be watchful? Don't you want to be ready? The church watchful, ready? Listen, so many commands of the scripture, and why is submission such a problem, and why is praying without ceasing, and why is all this other stuff a problem? Because until you get 1 through 11 worked out in 1 Thessalonians 5, you're not even interested in walking in holiness. You're not even interested in all these other commands. They just become dead works unto you. But once you're saved, once you're clothed in white, once you have that helmet of the hope of salvation and you have faith in Christ Jesus and you believe the, what the Bible said about Jesus, now you can't wait for him to come back. So if, if my parents came back and found out that we had broken things, we didn't want them to come back. <laughs> we didn't want to give the report. We didn't want to say, you know, he did it or I did it or, you know, what it was that we had done. But how much more now when you're, you're walking in righteousness and now bring it into the light. Listen, if what you're doing is in the light, walk it out openly. Walk as children of the light. If it's done in righteousness, let everybody see it. And I would encourage you that we would be the church ready, rapture ready, ready for the Lord's return, meaning this. If you're not right with God today, because the God of all peace sanctify you, right? Set you apart, make you holy. The God of all peace separates you and sets you apart. He's able to do all this. If he's able to do that, then with confidence you can say, he clothed me with righteousness. He gave me the helmet, the hope of salvation. And you can say, you know what? Come on back, Jesus. Come now. Revelation reveals that at the end, the spirit and the bride say, come, Lord Jesus. They say, Maranatha. See, the church that's watchful and ready for the Lord's return says what? I want the Lord to come now. The church that's sinning, the church that's defiled, the church that's not saved says, man, I hope Jesus doesn't come back now. So I grew up unsaved. I grew up in a church unsaved and I didn't want Jesus to come back. Now I want Jesus to come back.